Okay, uh, well, I'll start off with a uh, commercial. <laughs> There's always a commercial. I just released the fourth edition of Ham Radio for Dummies last year. And it was a very substantial rewrite given all the technology changes that have been going on. So if you know anybody out there that wonders what this ham radio business is all about, or uh, is trying to get their license. It's not a study guide, but it answers a lot of questions. And then once you do get that license and you're wondering what the heck do I do now? It's sort of a desktop Elmer. So uh, that's, my, that's my commercial for tonight. Okay, this uh, talk is obviously called Grounding and Bonding for Home and Mobile HF Stations. And um, there are some goals here. I want you all to come away with an understanding of what the words ground and bond mean. Um, we'll appreciate or have a higher appreciation of the different requirements for AC safety, lightning protection, and RF uh, floating around our stations. And uh, we'll discuss some issues and techniques for home HF stations. Um, I'm also going to go in to some of the special issues that uh, come up with mobile station. Um, and we're going to talk about this in three different ways, but I want you to take away that one common grounding and bonding system satisfies all the requirements. You don't have to do it three times, you can do it once. And then at the end, um, there are comprehensive resources. I sent the PDF version of the slides um, earlier, and those will be available on the website. So you don't have to worry too much about writing everything down as, as I go. This is kind of a fire hose of a talk. We'll touch on a lot of uh, topics and techniques and um, you can download the PDFs and, um, and get some more information that way. Okay, so who is this presentation for? Home HF station owners. Well, maybe you're building a new station, an entirely new station, just got your general and by golly, you're going to build a new station. And uh, that's the perfect time to, to do grounding and bonding before you get all that stuff stacked up to the ceiling. Um, when you're building a new station is the right time. Maybe you're upgrading a small station. We all start with a few boxes and, uh, and some gadgets and then some more gadgets and then another gadget, maybe another computer. And um, so you're upgrading it and you're saying, how can I bring this uh, up to date, up to speed. This is a good time also. Maybe you're adding an amplifier and you want to meet the neighbors. Oh, yeah. Uh, the uh, amplifier, when you add an HF amplifier, you'll find all the weak spots in your grounding and bonding in the uh, station. So this we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I know Ohio is in lightning country, as is Missouri, and um, Lightning protection is a big deal. So we're gonna to touch on techniques for that. And maybe you're just trying for better performance. You just want your station to play better for whatever reason. And uh, you'll find a number of suggestions in this talk that you may go, hmm, that, that might be for me. Maybe you're a mobile HF station owner. It's, it's never been more popular than it is now. Uh, if you're installing a new station in a vehicle, you've got to worry about power winding, uh, power wiring, equipment bonding, um, antenna and feed line issues, because you're right there in the car with it. And uh, all this equipment mounting and bonding needs to be dealt with. And then you've got to deal with RFI and noise in the car. The ham radio references that you want are the ARL handbook and the ARL antenna book. A lot of this material has been added to those books in the past few editions, and um, you will find uh, them very useful reference guide. Then there's this thing called the NEC handbook. Ugh, look how big this sucker is. That's, that's not um, just a wide angle lens. That is the NEC handbook. And uh, this is different than the National Electrical Code itself, which is a much smaller document. The handbook has a lot of explanation and rationale and drawings and photos and all this kind of stuff to help you uh, implement what's in the NEC. This is available at your library. You can get a used copy online for 30, 40 bucks. And any recent edition will be more than good for the uh, ham radio station builder. 
Then there's lightning protection for the amateur station. It was a series of three articles written by Ron Block, NR2B, in, in 2002 QSD. They're available to everyone on the ARL website. I hope you're uh, an ARL member, but even if you're not, you can get the um, you can get the articles, download them. Excellent reading. Ron was one of the reviewers for my book. He's a great guy. And then uh, there's some online tutorials that are just excellent. Jim Brown, k9yc.com slash publish that htm down there. I'll move my uh, cursor back and forth. He's written a couple of tutorials that are of particular interest to these topics. Power grounding, bonding, and audio for the amateur radio and RFI uh, for amateur radio, and then RFI ferrites and common mode chokes for hands. Both of those, along with a lot of other good stuff, are available at its website. And WHAI has a great website. Tom lives on top of a mountain in Georgia with 300 foot tower. Do you think he knows about lightning? Why, yes, he does. And so he has a lot of information available on what he did to keep from getting light, lightning damage. And then for mobile stations, your go-to is uh, Alan Applegate, K0, Bravo Golf. His website is full of good stuff. Okay, so, and then there's this, this little book here. This is the second edition of Grounding and Bonding. And uh, this covers AC wiring, lightning protection, RF management, a bunch of other things, um, mobile, uh, portable, second floor stations, um, all these kind of things. And I was really fortunate to have a number of experts, including the ARL lab, uh, review this uh, book before it went out. There are a lot of examples for you to use. It's not a cookbook, how to uh, solve all your grounding and bonding problems without, uh, you know, just follow it step one, step two, step three. It doesn't work that way. This is kind of a toolbox and it explains what's going on. It gives you a bunch of tools and techniques to deal with it, and then the rest is up to you. All right, let's jump right in. Excuse me. Okay, what is ground anyway? Ground has a lot of different meanings. It can be a noun, which means an earth connection. That's generally how you find it referred to in AC safety and lightning, or it can be just a local reference potential in a circuit or an RF. It's just your, your reference voltage that everything is based on. Um, it can be a verb, which is an action. Okay, I'm gonna ground this, which means I'm gonna connect this screwdriver across this charge up capacitor, I'm gonna ground it. Um, so all that means is to connect to the reference potential. And it can be an adjective, which describes a type of connection such as ground connector or ground system. And it can mean all these things at the same time. And you hear sentences like, I'm grounding the chassis to ground with the ground wire. And all three of those uh, uses of ground are different. And so you can see people having a good conversation about grounding and everybody's nodding up and down in the, uh, in the right direction. But after you listen for a while, you realize they're talking about completely different things. So we really have to be careful when we use that word. Now, an earth, the earth is not a magic sink into which you pound in a ground rod and you just pour in, pour in the RF and the lightning and it just magically disappears. It doesn't work that way. And it doesn't work that way on a vehicle body either. Um, it's got resistance. Uh, it's like a big resistive network and uh, you gotta take that into account. There are a lot of fuzzy definitions. RF ground, I try not to use that term because there really ain't no such thing. Uh, there's only a local reference potential and only for a certain range of frequencies. Um, RF ground has wildly different meanings in an IC or in a, a ham station or in a big transmitting system. So just try not to use that term. Try to use uh, reference potential. Ground loops are not the problem you think they are. Now, uh, the, the electricians don't like ground loops because first of all, uh, a loop in the ground can pick up uh, magnetic fields from power transformers and uh, high current AC. And it can also give a circulating path to neutral currents and all sorts of other bad things. Uh, they can cause hum in audio from picking up 
uh, magnetic field. But generally, they're not the problem you think you are. They are. If you look behind your equipment in a typical ham station, any connection between one piece of equipment and the other with a shielded cable that comes back to the same piece of equipment, that's a ground loop. And you're not going to get rid of all of them. There's no way. So even a modest station is going to have dozens of ground loops. What you have to do is manage it. And we'll talk about that later. Single point ground, same thing. Uh, you talk to the electricians. They want a single point ground so that all of the neutral and, um, and ground, equipment ground, currents, safety ground, go to one point. Uh, they don't want things daisy chained. They don't want big, long conductors between them. But that's kind of an AC concept uh, most of the time. Now, we'll talk about a single point ground panel. And uh, basically, it, what it means is all of the ground connections for that particular part of the system are together. And they're on one electrically small piece of uh, metal or what have you. And when I say electrically small, I mean very small with respect to a wavelength. If you talk about AC at 60 hertz, the wavelength was like 50 million meters. It's ridiculous. Single point ground can be the size of a, a football stadium. But when you get up to 20 meters, um, single point ground can't be much bigger than, oh, about two or three feet, you know, 20th of a wavelength or so. And as you go up in frequency, it gets even smaller. And you start getting into things like transmission line effects and stuff. So watch out. I'm just saying, just watch out when you use these terms. Make sure you think about what you're trying to accomplish. And each one of these set of requirements for AC and lightning and uh, RF management uses ground differently. So you have to watch it. Okay, bonding. I'm bonding with Dara right now. Uh, bonding is just a connection intended to keep two points at the same voltage. That's it. Doesn't mean uh, some fancy thing doesn't uh, you know, have any particularly strange requirements or guarantees about voltage or anything. It's just a connection intended to keep two points at the same voltage. The important thing for bonding in your station is that everything goes up and down together, particularly when we're talking about lightning protection. It's like a floating dock in a lake or something. You want all of the boats to go up and down together. You don't want all of this going on with the, the ropes and the ties and everything else breaking, and things like that. So everything goes up and down together and they're at the same voltage. So if you can make everything at the same voltage, what causes current to flow between two pieces of equipment. Voltage. If you don't have voltage, you won't have current. And if you don't have current, current is what causes RFI. Uh, it causes current to flow in uh, equipment where it should not be. And that's where you get RF feedback and distortion and all these other things. So you want everything to go up and down together. You want to minimize the amount of voltage between points A and B. It also prevents shock hazards from voltage differences down at AC. You want all of your gear to be thoroughly well grounded to your AC safety system so you don't have shock hazards. And uh, lightning surges can cause amazing uh, amounts of voltage. And we'll talk about that um, after a while. Uh, from the big currents that, that they have. And so uh, by bonding everything together, you can minimize the destructive voltage differences. And that's what causes the damage is the voltage difference. All of a sudden, this one goes up several kV and this one does not. Well, you're gonna have a lot of current here. So you wanna make sure that you're, uh, you're bonding things together so you don't have destructive voltage differences. Okay, it sounds hard. But it's not. And it sounds expensive, but it's not. All you have to do is connect stuff together with short, stout, low impedance cables or wires. So it does require that you use the right connecting materials, mostly heavy wire will do just fine. And hardware, if you use a, a clamp, an acorn clamp, or 
you use uh, screw terminals or you use those ground buses that can be uh, purchased for use in circuit breaker boxes and things like that. Anyway, you just got to use the right stuff. It's not expensive. And bonding works in your favor for everything, AC safety, lightning protection, and RF management. Okay, now for it to work, for bonding to work, if you're gonna connect two points together and you're going to say, okay, now they're at the same voltage. Well, uh, the connection has to be low impedance, okay? You can't have a 100 ohm uh, connection between two pieces of equipment and expect them to be at the same voltage. And it has to be electrically short. So once you get up, you get a wire that over a 10th of a wavelength, it starts to act more like an inductor. And then, it gets longer and it starts looking like an open circuit and then it starts looking like a capacitor and you know uh you just you just really don't want that so short electrically short connections it also has to be heavy enough to carry the expected current um if you're talking about a lightning protection ground out at your tower you had better use some heavy duty uh wire number six number eight number four whatever you can get because uh, the forces associated with lightning surge level currents are pretty amazing. And there are some YouTube videos about that that are kind of scary, but it has to be heavy enough and your local building code will have a minimum ground conductor size. And it has to be sturdy enough to survive the environment. If you're gonna bury it, it has to survive frosties. It has to uh, survive being driven on by trucks. It has to be heavy enough to stall the rototiller when you forget it was in there and you start the garden in the spring. Don't ask me how I know that. You definitely want the wire to be heavy. And so mostly the reason for using these big conductors is uh, heavy enough to carry the expected current and they have to be mechanically sturdy. For the ham station, inside the ham station, use strap. 20 gauge strap, you can use uh, flashing or uh, you can actually buy strap or you can use heavy wire, number 14 or larger, it's just fine, it's ground conductor. All that Romex that you refuse to throw away because you might use it someday, well, <laughs> here's what you can use it for. Number 14 and number 12 solid copper, are just fine. Okay, if you have to move the equipment around, uh, you can use flat weave tinned braid. Um, and that's in mobile stations particularly. Um, but exposed braid from old coax deteriorates the instant you take it out of the jacket. The braid is designed to be protected and compressed by that jacket. And the minute you take it out of there, it starts to uncompress so that the connections between all those little wires uh, start to degrade. Plus you get oxygen and water and it's a bad thing. If you wanna use old coax for a grounding connector, just leave it in the jacket, um, uh, make a pigtail at each end, crimp on a terminal, uh, waterproof it, and you got a dandy uh, big old wire. And even the flat weave tin braid, you have to protect it from moisture and chemicals. Don't use it outside is a generally good uh, idea. And if you're gonna use it in your vehicle, use the uh, coated, There's you can buy braid straps with a rubber coating that protects them from, um, from moisture and, and all that stuff that gets into under the car. Okay, let's talk about AC safety ground. It has several names. Depending on the age of your electrician and the location in the country, uh, equipment ground is the standard term that's used now. If you go to the NEC, you'll see it referred to as equipment ground. And it's also sometimes called third wire ground or green wire ground. It's all the same stuff. And um, the important thing about AC safety grounding is you need low resistance connections. And the low resistance is because these connections only have two purposes, only two. One is it provides a path back to your AC common point for fault currents like shorts or leakage. And so that current will flow all the way back to your circuit breaker box. It also stabilizes the AC power system voltage. If you go out and look at your power poles, you'll probably see several of them have a big ground wire that come down the pole from the transformer and um, they uh, uh, 
uh, either go directly into the ground that are wrapped around the bottom of the pole, that's called a butt wrap, um, or they have a, a ground rod right there. All of those connections, they're not that great, but you have so many of them, thousands and thousands of them at all the different power poles. It helps keep the power system from going crazy with voltage during faults and transients such as lightning. So that's the only reason we have these AC, uh, AC safety grounding. It has nothing to do with RF and it has precious little to do with lightning. Here's the uh, schematic of your typical residential power uh, system. Got a utility transformer. It's a center tapped uh, transformer out there. You can see the uh, ground connection from the center tap right here coming down to the ground. Then you've got the two big phases. They're out of phase and you've got one neutral wire. Okay, so then you go in and you take off the panel in your circuit breaker box and look at the scary stuff and you'll see two big buses. You'll see the neutral bus and that's where all the white wires go and you'll see the ground bus and that's where all the bare or sometimes green wires go and the ground bus is connected because it's mounted right on the equipment grounding bus uh, is mounted right to the metal enclosure and then there's a big connection from the ground bus to a grounding electrode and that typically means your ground rod uh, in deserts and other places there are different techniques like um, uh, the slab ground they call them and uh, where they use the rebar in a concrete slab for a house but that's not very common in the Ohio area. So this is your AC service common point right here and that's what the connection that's where it's trying to steer all that AC safety uh, ground current back to and so it can trip a GFCI breaker or AFCI breaker or whatever the idea is to keep the hazardous voltages and current away from you ladies and gentlemen okay and I know we're all amateur radio operators and I know that means we know everything uh, but uh, there are so many different types of AC devices today and the way that they need to be hooked up might not be the way it was 20, 30 years ago. And uh, you can cause trouble uh, if you don't hook stuff up right. Um, I think most of us could run a branch circuit and hook up some lights and for advanced readers, uh, you can do a three-way switch, my goodness. Um, once you get out there and you start looking at things like these little dimmer panels and uh, thermostats and all this kind of stuff, uh, you need to get some, some help. So what I recommend, this is my copy. Uh, this is from the previous edition. It only costs about 20 bucks. It's a great book and typically available at your big box stores especially follow the rules for sub panels and outbuildings. People are electrocuted all the time by hooking up sub panels and panels in outbuildings and not following the rules for grounding. It can be a little in obvious why they want you to do it in a certain way. Well, why can't I just run, you know, do it the way they tell you to do because you will avoid creating a hazardous voltage that you might uh, come in contact with. After you're all done, um, hire a pro electrician to come over and inspect the work. Uh, take a look, uh, look over your shoulder, but you know, oh, this is okay. Uh, you might wanna do this a little differently, um, uh, you know, an inspection or even having them do the work is uh, a good idea. Remember that your local code is the law, whether you like it or not, it's not there to make your life difficult, it's there to make your life longer. Yeah, I know we all talk about it being a way to make work for electricians, but uh, you definitely need to take advantage of all the uh, engineering hours that have gone into learning all this stuff and, and follow the code. Let's talk about lightning protection, stand by. Okay, lightning comes from way up there, many thousands of feet, and um, it gets down here, and it's within about 10 or 20 feet of the ground, and you can't really steer 
that much energy. You cannot, but you can help Mr. Lightning make good decisions. Okay, he's gonna go where he wants. Okay, what does he want? He wants a heavy direct path to the earth to dissipate all that charge in the earth, in the ground, he wants to get those electrons out there. And uh, so he can rebalance the charge uh, differential between the earth and the sky. So give them heavy direct paths to the earth. Um, inductance in this case is more important than resistance. And why is that? Because if you look at a, a lightning pulse, it's a very short pulse and it rises very quickly in terms of kiloamps per microsecond. That's fast. And the amount of voltage that you get across an inductor is the rate of change of current, kiloamps per microsecond, times the inductance. The inductance of a straight piece of wire, number 12 wire, one foot long, no bends, no coils, no anything else, is 300 and something nano -hindle. It's about a third of a micro -hindle. You hit that number 12 piece of wire with a lightning size current pulse, you can have hundreds of volts from one end of that piece of wire to the other. Hundreds of volts. So you want to minimize the inductance. That's wide, low inductance straps and straight runs and all that kind of thing. And all these paths for Mr. Lightning, they should be outside your residence. Don't run a lightning protection ground in your crawl space or in your attic or over through the spare bedroom or that kind of thing. It may be convenient, but what it does is it brings all that destructive energy inside your house and that's a bad thing. So don't make it easy for lightning to go through your station on the way to the earth. Have some kind of external grounding panel or something and we're gonna get into that um, where the lightning comes down and it says, oh look, there's a big heavy direct path to the earth. I think I'll go that way. And um, it's just like any other current. Um, if you've got two paths, it will take, it will divide according to the impedance of those paths. And it will primarily take the lowest impedance. So heavy direct paths to the earth are what you want outside of your station. Here is what we call a single point ground panel or SPGP. And basically it's a big metal panel and you mount it outside someplace typically where you bring the cables into the house or in a, a big cabinet outside the house. Uh, there's lots of different ways to do this. You'll notice that there's a dashed line between the, uh, the two parts of it. And this is called protected and the bottom is unprotected. So you want your protected lines, the ones that have uh, lightning arresters and gas discharge tubes and all that kind of stuff. You want them to be over here. You want the unprotected stuff to be over here. And the reason that is, is so the lightning doesn't get into the unprotected stuff and go, hey, look, there's an inductor. I'll just jump over to that. So keep them apart, okay? Um, even though it's a lot neater to have everything bundled together, so let's split the difference. You have one bundle of unprotected and one bundle of protected. Those, that panel is then connected to the ground outside your house. And we're gonna talk about the ground outside your house in a minute. It's connected to your station ground bus. And um, it's also connected to data or phone service boxes. All of those companies are required to have a ground electrode. And so you can mount the stuff right on your uh, right on your single point ground panel. But if you can't uh, bring this connection from the box either directly to your uh, perimeter outside ground or directly to this single point ground panel, the idea is to have all your grounds at one spot where they go into your outside ground system. Here's some of the stuff that I'm talking about on there. The thing at the upper left is an isobar trip light surge protector. They're not expensive. I think this one costs about 30, 40 bucks, something like that. 
It has four um, duplex outlets. It can handle 3,600 joules of uh, transient energy, as far as I know. And you can buy them in two, four, six, eight. And the idea is to put one of these on your single point ground panel and plug your uh, gear into that so that the surge protector dumps all of the energy into your ground system and not into your equipment. The thing at the upper right is a data or phone line protector. You can see some little um, gas discharge tubes and some MOVs and some uh, transorbs, all kinds of things. And down here are the um, antenna lightning arresters that we know and love, and they have gas discharge tubes in them. Okay, so the single point ground panel bonds the grounds of all the entry paths, everything that comes into your house from outside. That's your RF stuff, your um, AC service entrance should be close by. It may not be close by, but um, make a very heavy connection outside your house to it. Um, your TV, cable TV, your satellite TV, your uh, telephone or data system, all this kind of stuff. Uh, in general, they are trying to make all of those come in where the AC service uh, comes in, and that's the way to do it. But oftentimes you'll find uh, them sprinkled around the house, older houses in particular, with stuff hooked up willy-nilly, but they all have a ground rod. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. Okay, uh, the ground around the outside of your house is what's called perimeter ground. And uh, that's the buried ground rod attached to, or a buried ground conductor attached to ground rods outside your house. And if it can go all the way around the house, that's terrific. If it can't because of a concrete slab or something, make it run as far as it can. Um, but your single point ground panel should be connected to that. The important thing about the single point ground panel is that all of your protectors fire at the same time. So when that transient comes in, and lights up all these cables, all of the protectors fire at the same time. And so instead of getting one going to the moon over here and then another one going over to the moon over here and being at different voltages, even for a short period of time, um, they all go up and down together and that minimizes the voltage between them. So that minimizes the voltage between your TV, your phone system, your home entertainment system, all that kind of stuff. Okay, and this includes the putting on stuff on the SPGP, non-RF and AC power. So you need to put one of these uh, surge protectors out there too. We already talked about keeping your protected and unprotected cables separate. Here's an example from K4RO. Uh, Kirk lives on a hilltop in, uh, west of Nashville. And he was losing a lot of equipment. Every time a thunder boomer would come through something, would be damaged or destroyed. So he got tired of that and he bought a big piece, a couple of big pieces of, uh, of aluminum and he bolted them to the wall of his garage and he mounted absolutely everything that has to do with antenna switching or filters or all that kind of stuff is mounted on those panels. And then up here at the top, you can see the BHG, the big honking wire that goes from the a single point ground panel to the external ground system. And does it work? Since he put this up and he's had several years to test it, he has lost a zero, exactly zero uh, pieces of equipment. So this bonding business seems to work out. Here's mine. Um, I have a single point ground panel in my station. I have several of uh, single point ground panels. I, I'm not sure you can call them single point if I have several, but um, I live on a ridge. Um, my station is on a ridge um, in rural Missouri. I call it the Crawford County Cumulonimbus Discharge Facility. I knew when I bought it, it was gonna get hit because it's up high and I could see trees that have been hit and burned. So I bought it anyway. And um, I took a lot of time to, put in these panels and you can see what's in the back of the rack. You can see that I've got my antenna switches, my amplifiers, my rotator controls, all this kind of stuff. Here's my isobar down here. And uh, that's my single point ground panel. It is a metal rack. And in the back of the rack, 
you can see my remote power on and off thing right here. And down here is one of those uh, antenna line protectors that has the relay that shorts out the uh, feed lines to the radios when the power is off. And then you can, I have two stations. So you can see one, one wire coming in here, that's right there. And that's to station A in the, in the shack. And you can't really see it very well, but here's the ground wire for station B. So we have two tables with radios on them. And then this wire goes to the perimeter ground system, which is just outside the, the house. So about five feet away at most is the uh, buried ground wire and the ground rods. And since I hooked all this stuff up, I haven't lost anything either. So it really works. Okay, so you got to bond all of your earth connections together. That is required by code. Um, and when they come out to hook up your stuff now, a lot of times they will say, well, where is your ground rod? Where is your AC um, service ground, et cetera? And they are starting to pay attention to that. But you want to make sure that all of your ground rods are connected together. If they are not connected together and you just put in a ground rod and then you have a ground rod for your electrical panel and a ground rod for your phone and a ground rod for your TV, you put up a, an FM antenna and so you got another ground rod over here. If they are not connected together, what are they connected with? Dirt, okay? And what is the resistance of dirt? It's pretty high. If you measure the resistance of the dirt, it's going to be 10, 20, 50, 100 ohms. What happens if you hit that with a thousand amp lightning surge? Well, Ohm's law, uh, so you're going to have 5, 10, 50, 100,000 volts between those two ground systems. And that's where you get these stories like, I was sitting there minding my own business and a thunderstorm came through and I saw the flash and then this big green flash jumped between my uh, telephone and the computer system and now nothing in the house works. Well, the problem is all those ground systems were not tied together. And because they were not tied together, they did not stay at the same voltage. And so one went way up and there's an arc to the other the other system. So that's how, that's why you want to make sure you bond all these things together. Don't create low impedance pass through your station. Okay, so here's this big thing called a lightning attractor, as hands know it, as a tower. And so you get a close hit, it may not be a direct hit, but even a nearby hit is enough. Um, and you wind up with a big lightning surge coming down here. And you run your feed lines into this entry panel and you've done everything. And some of the lightning current, yes, it's going to go into the ground rod, but it's going to divide like any other uh, current. And if it sees a path through your radios, through the branch circuit, through the AC service panel to the AC service ground, a big bunch of it's going to go that way too. So you don't want to encourage. Uh, lightning to make a bad decision here and by creating low impedance pass through your station. Ground pass should go around your station. So here comes your feed lines, your towers grounded, the, here's the single point ground panel, uh, here's an AC power protector. You've got all these ground line uh, rods outside the building and they're all tied together with heavy duty wire. So if lightning comes in, say on the power system that's going to come to your service entry. And sure, some of it's going to go to this ground rod right here, but some of it's also going to go on that unprotected AC. And so what you want to do is make sure that when you plug in your station gear, it's to one of these things mounted on a single point ground panel. And then that remaining current, most of it will go to the ground. So you want to give it as many direct low impedance heavy duty connections to the ground as you can. Out at a tower, here's your typical lattice tower looking down on it and a concrete tower base. And we've seen this uh, drawing a bunch of times in the handbook over the years where you have a ground rod for each leg of the tower and you have a ground grid around it. So connected, buried, heavy duty wire. And if you really wanna do it, um, Add some more wire, uh, extended buried radial wires, 30 feet or more long, 
from those ground rods from here out into the yard or pasture or whatever, as long as you got the guy over there with the backhoe, have him dig a little shallow trench and put these things in. And uh, that's a really good ground system for your tower. And you wanna make sure that you bond your feed lines to the tower every 50 feet. That means uh, connecting the shield to the tower. And remember, towers have inductance too. So if there's a big lightning surge coming down that tower, it's going to make a lot of voltages. You can have 100,000 volts between the top and the bottom of a tower, easy. So you wanna bond the coax to the tower so it doesn't wreck your coax and um, puncture holes through it and all that kind of stuff. So you buy one of these brackets, you put some more connectors on and you bolt it to your tower. If you got an insulated uh, tower, you can make a spark gap. Um, and there's plenty of information on how to do that uh, where it just jumps over um, and you limit the voltage to about 3000 volts before it starts to arc and then the arc uh, clamps that voltage at a pretty low voltage. Here's um, a single point ground panel at my tower base. I've got one of these at each of the three towers and it's just a plastic fiberglass electrical uh, box and I've got my flashing panel in here. You can see my ground connection right here, the ground electrode right there. Here comes the hard line that goes back to the shack and that's the common. And then I've got three um, antennas hooked up to this particular switch. It's an RCS4L, L is uh, lightning protected. It's got a gas discharge tube in it. And each one of my irrigate, each one of my rotator uh, lines is also protected by a uh, gas discharge tube. These are 75 volt uh, gas discharge tubes. And I just used a terminal strip now I'm gonna save you a lot of money here. Um, if you've gone out to look at rotator uh, cable and you go, man, that's expensive. You know, what's not expensive is irrigation system control cable. This is a 10 conductor number 18 direct berry irrigation control cable. And this is a lot cheaper than rotator cable. Plus you can bury it. So what I did was I doubled up two of the uh, wires for pin one, which is the solenoid, and pin two, which is the other, uh, the other wire in the solenoid circuit. And the rest are number 18, just like regular old rotator cable. And then you can save the fancy, flexible, stranded, expensive, rotator cable for up at the top of the tower where you need a, a rotator loop or something. This is way cheaper than buying a rotator cable. See, aren't you glad you showed up tonight? Okay, lightning protection is also important. Read Ron Block's in our 2 bs uh, QST articles. He comes up with the idea of a protected zone. And um, uh, he says, out every piece of equipment that you want, draw a big box around it and look at every wire that comes out of that zone, even little AC plugs for a clock, anything that you don't protect in there, that's where the lightning will get. So um, read Ron's articles. Uh, you have to protect every line crossing the boundary somehow. And then you also bond the equipment together in your station. Okay, RF management. Mm. The first thing to remember is that everything in the station is an antenna. And the more you don't want it to act as an antenna, the better it will act as an antenna. But think about it. Say you have a 40 meter dipole in the backyard and what's the wavelength, 40 meters? Mm. 40 meters, how long is that? It's about 125, 130 feet. So anything within 130 feet of that antenna is in the near field. And uh, it's going to couple very strongly to all the conductors in your station. So you're right in the near field. Um, uh, it's not just because it doesn't say antenna on it doesn't mean it's not acting as an antenna. So everything in your station is a feed line. 
is, is an antenna. Dipoles, feed lines, your single point ground connector, your tuner, your jumpers, your protected power, your safety grounds, you, um, the PC, all that kind of stuff. All those things will pick up RF and uh, often do. So you want to make sure that you worry about your bonding. Okay, so forget about an all band RF ground. Just you're just not going to do it. Okay, you'll chase uh, chase your tail for a long time. Concentrate instead on bonding everything together. So no matter what the frequency or anything else, it all goes up and down together. Keep your connections electrically short so they don't start acting like inductors, and you want to keep everything at the same voltage so that. Uh, the voltage that gets picked up on these things from being in the near field does not cause current to flow into the various pieces of equipment and cause RFI. If you add an amplifier with high RF field strength, you're going to find all the weak spots in your bonding system for your station. So it requires extra attention to bonding. What I recommend to people is create a common reference plane or a bus like uh, your basic thing that we've seen in the handbook for decades, uh, a piece of pipe, everybody goes and gets the cheapest possible piece of copper pipe. Um, that's a uh, half inch and they create a bonding bus. Okay, use the ground clamps, it's half inch, so it'll fit half inch or five eighths inch um, electrical clamps. And then use short direct connections between all of your equipment, including the computer. And even if it doesn't have voltage uh, supplied to it, if it's unpowered, like an antenna switch, make sure you wire it up to the enclosure. And then over at the end, you run a big strap or a big heavy wire to the single point ground panel. Okay, so here's a typical station uh, with about a tenth of the number of cables uh, that are actually in the station and you wind up with all kinds of different audio cables and control lines and power and RF and computer stuff. Okay, so what do you do? You can't get rid of this stuff. Uh, what you do is remember that the area of the loop tells you how much voltage is going to be picked up by that loop. So you wanna minimize the area and the, you can do that in a couple of ways. You can do it with short cables, minimize the length, or you can coil them up. And uh, both of those will work. And uh, basically that helps you keep from picking up all this RF. Use a bonding bus and a reference plane underneath everything. And uh, use shielded cables for everything, especially uh, audio and uh, data controls and all this kind of stuff. Remember, short straps or wire. So basically, if you've got this bonding bus in the back, you can uh, just lay the cables on the bus, use a tie wrap or a Velcro strap or something, and tie them so they're all together. And it minimizes the length uh, and the area of the, the loop. Here's an example. Uh, you can see my reference plane under a couple of radios. It's more of that aluminum flashing. I just unrolled it and screwed it down to the uh, plastic uh, banquet table. And I just lay all of my cables on it. Uh, I connect all of the equipment to the reference bus. And so far so good, knock on wood, it seems to work pretty well. Uh, it helps keep uh, from any surprises during contest and stuff. The towers are about anywhere from a couple hundred to a hundred feet away and I do run full power. So um, occasionally I will see a blink somewhere, usually in my uh, uh, video monitor, but I don't have RFI problems. Okay, ground system review. A single solid ground system, one made of short, heavy direct connections can satisfy all of the requirements for AC safety, lightning protection, RF management, and clean audio. So if you spend some time working on a solid ground system and bonding everything together, keep your protectors together, and build in a perimeter ground to keep lightning outside, you'll be in good shape. And it's not like 
AC safety current only flows on the green wire. Nope, uh, everything flows on any wire. So basically you build one big, good, solid ground system and it solves all your problems. Okay, let's jump over to the mobile station. Now, RF issues can be way more intense because you're in the antenna. And uh, special power wiring conditions, uh, considerations, you have to worry about that. What about bonding and the vehicle body and mounting antennas? Hmm. Well, let's start with uh, mobile power. You've got to worry about fusing, ampacity, which is the ability of the conductor to uh, handle the current with a minimal amount of voltage drop. Where does your power system return go? What about these battery monitoring systems? And uh, what happens if you get RF pickup? And what are these things called DC, DC boosters? Uh, it's not like the old days. Uh, cars are a lot different. Okay, so first off, fuses in both leads. Always we keep hearing it. Uh, don't be tempted to leave the fuse out of the, uh, the negative lead. And thankfully, uh, manufacturers have decided to put a fuse in that lead. So that's good. Make sure you have an adequate rating for the power connection and these little power sockets in the vehicles for auxiliary power or whatever. Typically they're seven or eight amps. They're not big enough for full power, uh, 100, 100, 150 watt HF or even 100 watt VHF. So you've got to, get in there and make sure you have enough power. The power wiring has to be adequately sized. Your maximum resistance is equal to the maximum voltage drop you can tolerate between the, the battery where you hook this up and divided by the maximum current that the radio is going to um, draw. Half a volt divided by 25 amps, you only get 0.02 ohms to play with. That's 20 feet of number 10 wire. And remember that mobile radios, they're 12 volts. Yeah, right. Uh, they usually need at least 11 volts um, and usually more to keep from misbehaving. So look at the specifications uh, of the radio, make sure you supply enough voltage to the radio. And don't forget the connector resistance because you're going to have crimp terminals or ring terminals or something like that. Those have to be included. All right. So you go in and you lift the, uh, the hood and you look at your battery and you see one of these goofy things. And it's mounted on the negative terminal of the battery. What the heck is that? It's a current sensor and it tells the controller in your car how much current, how many electrons are going in and out of your battery. So it makes sure the, the controlling system and make sure to keep your battery full charge. This is particularly important if you have an engine idle shutoff. You pull up to um, a, a stoplight and your engine turns off, the controller has to make sure, darn good and sure, that you have enough juice in the battery to start the car back up. So these battery sensors, don't mess with them, okay? They're very important. You want to connect your DC return for your radio down here to the chassis ground point. So you're going to look at that chassis uh, of the uh, battery sensor, and you're going to go way down into the bowels of the earth there and look at your um, engine compartment and find this chassis ground point. That is where you want to connect the return for your DC power. It's called home run wiring connecting everything back to this one chassis ground point. If you want to keep RF off your uh, power cables, twist them together. Put them, in the, uh, put them in a drill chuck and twist them until you've got about a, a twist every inch or two. That will help uh, balance the pickup so that it doesn't turn into a differential signal that uh, gets into your radio. Do not use vehicle boosters or ham gear. There are DC to DC boosters that are used, particularly in engine idle shutoff vehicles, um, so that all of the electronics has a uh, constant approved voltage. Um, do not use the vehicle booster, booster for ham gear. It's not rated for that. 
get a booster of your own and use home run wiring just like the radios. What about bonding? Okay, well, used to be we could just bolt stuff to the car and it would be pretty much okay, but body components are not always well bonded. Sometimes they're not even metal. Um, so don't use these system ground points. You, you poke around in your wiring harness, you'll see a bunch of wires all tied together. Do not use that as a power return because what happens is you inject a bunch of current into that and it confuses the other systems that are hooked up there. And you can cause problems with your other vehicle uh, electronics. Don't do that. Run it all the way back to the battery. And if you're gonna bond to the battery or to the body, you have to realize that you're creating new R, uh, return and RF paths for your transmitted signal. So you have to be very careful uh, when you bond your equipment to the body that, uh, you, you got to check this out. Maybe it's perfectly okay, but um, you could be creating uh, a path for RF that nobody expected. Protect connections. Use that anti-corrosion compound. If you're going to use the, the braided straps, make sure they're protected, all that kind of stuff. This is a nasty environment for automotive electronics. Single pieces of gear, gear do not need bonding to anything. Mobile type stuff doesn't need to be bonded to the, the car in any way. It, as I know we've all done this. We got a new radio. We stuffed it down in between the seat and the transmission hump. And by golly, it worked just fine. We swore to God that we would fix it someday. But years pass, and it never had any problems at all. So it's not required to bond these mobile radios to the gear unless the manufacturer tells you to. Um, when you hook stuff up to a body panel, that is part of the antenna system, okay? Uh, you are in the antenna system for the car. So you may have to isolate the sub-panel mount and mount it on some kind of plastic standoff or something. And you don't want to bond the control head to the body. They're not designed to do that. And when you do that, when you bond the control head to something metal, you're creating a different path that the manufacturer did not plan for, and you could cause all kinds of problems. So don't bond the control head to the body. Just leave it be. You can also use standalone mini racks. Truck toolboxes are great carry case stations. You have some security issues because you could take them out. Well, so can anybody else. But um, you have to have to make a trade off there, um, and they can all be bonded together inside, and that works quite well. And um, and so all the ham stuff is all bonded together, and you don't have to uh, you don't have to worry about uh, whether you're mounted on the car pillar or anything else. Um, you can. Uh, just remember that there's no need for a vehicle bond. You don't have to do that. Mechanical security is really important. Watch out for airbags. They're everywhere now. Um, if you don't know where they are, get a service manual and make sure that you do not put um, radio stuff in front of where the airbag comes out. Because if you hit something and the airbag comes out at 100 miles an hour, it, so will the uh, radio equipment that you mounted on its output panel. So like the, uh, like the steering wheel or on the dash, and they're all over, so you gotta be very careful. You can use the channels under trim strip, uh, which helps shield cables from direct RF pickup and pr protects the cables. Uh, watch out for hidden wiring. Uh, you don't want to drill through a panel and then find out you just, drilled into a 12 volt battery connection. Don't do it. Um, look for a service bulletin and a repair manual. Sometimes you can get a, an installing uh, group to do the installation for you. They already know where all that stuff is. They already have all the fancy little screws and washers and clips. And when they break one of those old plastic doodads, they've got a million of them, they can put it right back in. So. 
uh, ask somebody like an electrician that kind of knows what they're doing. If you're going to bond to the body, do it at the antenna. A through panel NMO is probably the best. It actually makes good contact from the shield right to the panel. Uh, a lip mount that goes on a uh, like a hatchback or something, they need an additional body bond and a, another little wire that goes to the body. And beware of paint. Paint uh, is a lot sturdier than it used to be. And it can make sure that you don't have a good connection where you thought you had one. Mag mounts don't work very well at HF. Uh, you only get about 100 picofarads per magnet. So what happens is that means the return current is your coax shield. That's part of the antenna. And it causes RFI. It'll light up everything in the car coming right back in. So what you need to do is have a uh, through panel NMO mount. And if you're going to do any decoupling, do it at the antenna and the radio. When you go out and buy a new car, um, look out, uh, talk to the salespeople about upfit packages. Tell them that you're going to put in some radio stuff. They may have a package all ready to go. Fleet sales, if your salesperson doesn't know about that, your fleet sales people certainly will. Fleet sales and resale, talk to them. Get some guidance from your service department. And manufacturer service bulletins about installing radios are good. And like I said, car audio and two-way radio shops can often uh, steer you right. Well, are we done yet? Yes, we are done. And um, I have a list of additional resources that are on the uh, uh, PDF slides. If you really want to get in there and dig, um, that will help you out. So, Dave, back to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ward. <laughs> this has been an extremely attentive audience. And this mic oh, I thought they were well. asleep. Weren't. They were very attentive. There are about 120 people here, plus whoever's on Zoom, and I don't know the number there. And we have just a few minutes for a few questions, if you have the time. I have the time. Ask away. Okay. Any hands here? Question? Uh, I have got a related question. Um, my roommate in college back in the 70s was my Elmer, and he worked in a TV repair shop, and he said in the old-fashioned TVs that did not have transformers, they had to use isolation transformers to work on them. Well, since the 80s, we have computer switching supplies that don't have transformers in them, and, and now our radios and that don't have transformers. So. Should we consider isolation transformers for that kind of gear? Well, no. Um, the I believe the switching supplies have galvanic isolation through capacitors, and um, and so it's not connected directly to um, it's not connected directly to the line. So no, I don't think you have to worry about that. Any other questions? Back here. Well, what about counterpoise ground? Okay, F first off, uh, this isn't an April Fool's joke. Yeah. I've got uh, uh, a recliner, a love seat recliner in the living room. It's got these buttons you push, it'll automatically go up and down. Well, I'm in the radio room and I'm trying to work a rare DX station and the light recliners go out. You can't push a button. It won't work till you unplug it and, and re, reset it. Now, I'm not gonna cut down on power because I'm trying to work this rare DX station. So mama's out there hollering. I got my earphones on. So we have a little problem there. So <laughs> wonder if you had any suggestions. Well, the, the recliner is gonna have a controller 
and it's going to have um, input and output cables. And what you need to do is use some ferrite chokes to um, block the RF from getting into that controller. So go take a look at um, K9YC's tutorials and um, order yourself probably some number 31, type 31 ferrite cores and uh, pop a few on and see if that doesn't help. Jack, go ahead. What about counterpoise grounds? For instance, sticking something in the way of a counterpoise ground on the third floor apartment for 10 meters. Well, a counterpoise is a fancy way of saying the rest of the antenna. So uh, that's what it is. You, you bring in your infed or whatever, and you've got a counterpoise hooked up. That's just the rest of the antenna. So um, yeah, if you put ferrite or some other conductor or something, add some impedance, it's just like putting some impedance in the antenna. It's going to change things. So um, the best thing to do is figure out how to get it to work without a counterpoise and maybe use the uh, coax shield. Uh, typically, I mean, I have an infed halfway here. The coax serves just fine to stabilize the impedance at the feed point for that antenna. I don't have to cut it to resonance or anything else. It, it's just a way of stabilizing the impedance at the end of the antenna. But the counterpoise is just the rest of the antenna. OK, any other questions? OK. Thank you, Ward. It's been a great presentation. Um, I know we've all learned a lot. I'm, I'm glad you liked it. I, I hope everybody got a lot of stuff out of it. And you can download those uh, slides and get confused even more. <laughs> I, I will send those over to uh, Mike, and uh, he'll send those out probably tomorrow sometime. Okay, well, 73s, and thanks to Dara for doing the Hamvention. We all appreciate it so much. I'm so glad that it's happening in person this year. And, um, you know, you guys do an awful lot of work for that on our behalf. Much, much obliged. Thank you.